Hello. Thank you for joining the WEED user group. I hope you can hear and see me. My name is Tamo Nakara. I'm the uh, DX community lead here at um, WeedWorks. And uh, okay, I'm living on our camera. We actually have. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see if we'll swivel all the way. Oh, let's swivel a little bit more. We need them here. Oh, yes. Actually, uh, team was here. Oops. We're all here for um, the Developer Experience Conference that we ran yesterday. So it's lovely to have the team here. We're all in San Francisco. And logged in online is Steve Wetzel, or Steve Wetzel. I know there's no E at the end. You want to turn your camera and mic on, Steve? Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Steve's actually running from London. So thanks for calling in. And um, Steve has an excellent story. Um, of what he's worked on with with Luke a little bit, right? You guys have been working together. So. He kind of started this ball rolling at an internal um, hackathon at Pivotal. So, of course, we got wind of it and we're very excited. Uh, Tamal said, um, my name is Steve. I work at Pivotal. And um, as part of a hackathon a couple of months ago, um, I was playing around with Scope because I was always already like I'm, I'm working on Cloud Foundry and was always interested in like seeing Cloud Foundry and seeing it visualized because you kind of like have this idea about the whole system in your head, but you've never seen it, right? And um, Scope is actually a really great tool to do that. And that's where, what we are going to look into today. There will be a little bit of demo and um, I'm going to kick it off with a little bit of an introduction about Cloud Foundry because I thought that maybe the audience of the Weave user group is maybe a bit more like in into container systems like Kubernetes and um, Docker Swarm, uh, Amazon ECS, that kind of stuff. While Cloud Foundry is a bit more like app centric. Um, some call it like PaaS, platform as a service. Um, you might have seen Heroku. Um, so the idea here is like less about like I want to build and run a container. It's really more like hey, I want to really run my app and I don't really care how. Just like push it to the cloud and have it run. And that brings us to this command, and that basically is the essence of like Cloud Foundry, CF push. And um, I don't know if like people on the line, honestly, I don't even know who's on the line, um, if they have ever seen this in, in action. So maybe we can just take a couple of seconds to actually show that. Um, so let me just make this a bit bigger, clear this out. Um, is the um, font size big enough for everyone? I guess it is, because it's screen share. But if not, shout. Um, so what um, you see here. Sorry, yeah, maybe uh, just zoom in just a little bit. Make it a bit bigger, yes. play this out again. So what you see here is I'm in a directory, also like in a detached branch, but uh, detached um, Git repo, but that doesn't matter. Um, what you see as the files in this directory are actually Ruby files. So this is a Ruby app like inside the directory, and I want to make this run in the cloud. So how do I do this uh, in Cloud Foundry? Well, I say CF push, and I give this app a name. Let's say Dora. Right. So what this will do is we'll take all of these um, files, and I'm using the Cloud Foundry um, command line utility to do this. We'll take all of these files in this directory, upload them to the Cloud Foundry platform. Um, in this case, I'm using a platform, a, a development platform here in, on GCP in, in London. And um, we'll push all these files up there, and it will take them and we'll bundle them up in a con into a container. And we use build packs to do that. Um, so if you, if you want to learn more about build packs, you can look at Heroku. They also use build packs um, or the Cloud Foundry docs. But basically what they do is like they, they take the, you know, the application code and bundle it up into a container. Um, you can see multiple build packs here. So we out of the box support like a bunch of uh, programming languages. And the platform should automatically compile them for you and run them. OK, so you saw that the container was built. And then we push it up. And then now the app is running. And actually, here's the link. So we go to that. We can open that, and here on the left side, you see Dora. Dora running on GCP in the cloud. Um, and yeah, I didn't have to build a container myself. Uh, and then also the platform gives you nice like little tools. Like for example, you can take a look at the logs of Dora. So if I do this, um, I will be tailing the logs. And now if I refresh this, like automatically you get like all the logs for this app, which um, comes in pretty handy because as you see right now, I have like one instance only. But if I scale this up to, let's say, I don't know, 10 instances or whatever, I would see all the logs across all instances here centralized. Um, so if you want to do that on like a container platform, it would take you probably a little bit more of work, while here you get it out of the box. All right, cool. So that is like what Cloud Foundry is about. So let's switch back to the, go away. How do I get rid of this? 
take this away. Actually, while you're um, doing that, I just want to do a quick pause. Um, mm -hmm. Check with this audience. Anybody have questions about Cloud Foundry? I know that was a, I mean, you're probably here because you're interested in Cloud Foundry, but I just want to take a moment in case anybody has any questions before we move forward. So, sorry, my, oh, let's keep that, my chat windows. Um, okay, I think it looks like it's all right. Cool. Yeah, so if you have questions during this demo, during this presentation, just like, um, yeah. you know, at any time, ask them and interrupt me at any time. Cool. So back to the presentation. We now have seen, like, how easy it is to push an application to this platform. Um, and that's the whole point. We want to make it easy for application developers. However, behind the curtain, the system is pretty complex. And there's, like, lots of, lots of um, different components. It's a distributed system. Um, uh, in a production environment, you might have, like, a couple of hundred VMs, like, um, orchestrated to provide this experience, right? And how do we actually deploy the system itself? Well, we use a tool called Bosch um, to deploy Cloud Foundry on like any type of infrastructure. Um, and to really understand how we uh, scope can work with Cloud Foundry, we have to understand Bosch a little bit more today. And um, that's why I want to take a couple of couple minutes to like uh, introduce you to Bosch. Um, so let's take a step back. Let's not try to um, or like assume like we want to deploy something to the cloud that's a bit simpler than Cloud Foundry. Let's say we had a very simple imaginary cluster that only consists of a master and maybe a couple of slave nodes, right? Um, it doesn't really matter what it is, but let's just imagine that. So we want to push that to the cloud, deploy that system to the cloud. Um, and the cloud can be many things, right? It could be AWS, it could be uh, GCP, Google Cloud, it could be Azure, vSphere, you get the point. Many different ISs. And we ideally want to be able to do that on all of them. And that's why we have this tool called Bosch. And, um, you know, what, what is Bosch? Bosch is a deployment system, a release engineering system also, that uh, gives us this, like, cloud agnostic um, place we are in. Um, so what do we do? Like, first, like, when we get to a new um, account in an IS of our choice, then we deploy uh, or we, we, we bring up one VM first, and that VM is the so-called Bosch director. And that will be kind of like our remote control into this cloud. So that will, through this remote control, we can spin up other VMs and kind of, like, incepted. Um, so once we've done that and we have scripts to do that, um, we come up uh, with three moving pieces for our cluster. So first of all, the cluster will run on a bunch of VMs. So we need to define an operating system to be used by these VMs. Um, and in the Bosch world, this is called a stem cell. And um, on the Bosch website or the, also the Pivotal website, you will get a bunch of stem cells that have been vetted and have been built by us. So you can be sure that there are not any open CVEs and, and the kind of stuff in them. But at the end of the day, it's, it's an operating system, Ubuntu, CentOS, usually, but could be also Windows. OK, so once we um, identified a stem cell, an OS that we want, want to run our cluster on, then we go on and build uh, what's called uh, a Bosch release. Ideally, somebody else builds that for you. but. Um, you know, you need a Bosch release. And what is that? It's, it's basically a big tarball that bundles up all the binaries that this cluster really consists of. So you could imagine maybe like some binary that acts as the master and maybe some other binary that, that uses the master but it's a slave. And maybe some comment code. So the important piece is like this cluster release has a lot of binary code in it and it um, yeah, defines also so-called jobs like that relate to these binaries. Um, and then there's a third piece. It's the, uh, the manifest. We call it manifest. It's, it's a YAML file, and it, um, it does all the wiring. It, like, in this case, defines that we want to have three VMs for our cluster. They should use that stem cell from up here. And we want to put different pieces out of this release table onto each of these VMs. And that makes up our cluster, right? And once we have done all of this, so we, we got our release, we downloaded it from somewhere, we downloaded the stem cell, and we created our manifest file, then we upload all of that to the Bosch director. And to do that, we have so-called Bosch CLI, so it's the equivalent to the director for you to interact with the director. And you upload the stem cell, you upload the release table, and you set your deployment using that manifest. And at that point, the director knows all of these things, and you can say, Bosch deploy, cluster, and the director will go out to do its thing, right? Like, do what you said in your manifest. Bring up one VM, put, like, software for the master on it, and there you go. You have a master. Now it goes on, like, does the same thing for the two slaves that we wanted. All right, cool. At that point, we have a, uh, a cluster, and we can do that on multiple clouds. That's pretty awesome. Uh, now, how do we monitor and troubleshoot a cluster? 
Well, Bosch gives us a couple of tools to do that. Uh, the Bosch CLI, you can, for example, look at all the VMs that you know, make up this cluster, in this case, like free. You see like their names, their state, their IPs. Um, so that's pretty good. You can also go like one step further and can look at the jobs running on each of the VMs. And um, that's basically like the, 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 the software that makes up these, these nodes, right? Uh, so in this case, everything is running fine. Um, so it looks good. Now, if you see like an actual problem, you experience a problem, what you can do, you can use Bosch to SSH onto a VM to maybe troubleshoot, right? To see like what's going on there. Um, and um, Bosch allows you to do that like in an abstract fashion. So you don't need to know the IP or like user credentials like for each VM in the cluster. So that's nice. Sometimes you don't want to SSH onto the VM to know what's going on. You can also download logs through Bosch like all the locks on the whole box, which is quite nice. Um, and depending on what system you just deployed using Bosch, the system itself might also like help you out with like metrics, for example. So what you see here on the screen is actually from the so-called uh, Firehose that, that comes with Cloud Foundry. Um, and this is it's a Firehose where all the different components in this distributed system send their metrics to. And from there, you can grab them and can basically put them into like a time series database and like put like a dashboard on top of it, like, like here, Grafana, right? So that's quite nice. Like now you have something visual. But all of these tools, including this, this dashboard, what, what they require you as the operator, as the user of the system to know is quite a bit because otherwise it's hard for you to make sense of the system. So these tools are not necessarily the best tools to explore a system that you don't re already know very well or like, yeah, to interactively like uh, troubleshoot the system in, 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 in a you know in a better fashion, a more visual fashion, um, and it would be nice to have something that that gives us that right, that allows new users to um, explore a system in in a, in a more interactive way, and you know that something could be scope, and it actually turned out to be scope um, because that does that pretty well. Um, the only problem when we started with this is that uh, scope is primarily like targeted at um, container platforms like Kubernetes and um, Docker Swarm. And it works really well with those platforms out of the box, right? Um, but it turned out it's actually pretty easy, relatively easy to make this work in, the, in our Bosch world, in the Cloud Foundry world to achieve the same thing. Uh, what do we have to do to make it work? Well, we create another Bosch release, this time for Weave Scope itself. And that Bosch release basically only has two. Steve, yeah. sorry, just wanted to do a little pause because um, I know Bosch is like, you know, this big, massive thing. So does anybody have questions on Bosch? Do, does everybody feel clear before we move into the next bit? Um, and also we do have a, an earlier question um, mm -hmm. that was, uh, is Cloud Foundry all container based? In AWS, there's EC2 and ECS. Is right. That so yeah. Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry, the platform itself uh, consists of VMs, right? But then, uh, like the platform offers, like um, the applications running on top of the platform, they run within containers. And we will actually see that later once we get Scope up and running. I can actually show you uh, what that means. Um, but yes, we use containers on on top of the platform, but the platform itself is not containerized. If that makes any sense? It's kind of like Kubernetes, right? The cluster itself, um, from what I understand, it's it's just VMs. Anyway, let's go back to uh, the scope release that we saw here, right? Like, because that's, that's like really what this Hack Day project was about. Um, so we wanted to you take the different bits of, 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 of scope, and there's actually two bits um, that we care about. Scope app, it's like this nice UI that you see that, that shows you these, these graphs, these um, nodes and edges that, show you, that represent your system. That's the scope app. And then there's another thing, it's this scope pro. So under the cover, they're actually the same binary. You just run it with different um, op options, right? But uh, for our purposes, we want to look at them as two different things, two different jobs. Um, and um, yeah, we put these two jobs uh, into our release, define them in there, and then we create a manifest again, right? And this manifest, what it defines here, I don't know if you can see that, it's like one little box. So we want one VM, and that one VM should only have the scope app job running on it. So basically, we want to bring up a web server that serves our uh, web app. Um, and yeah, same old story. We upload the release, we set the manifest, we tell Bosch to deploy this thing, the scope app in this case, brings up a VM, puts the binary on it, and starts it. At that point, we have the web app running. Um, however, it's empty, so we don't see anything, doesn't display anything, because the next thing we need to do, we need to get this, this little star here, the probe, co-located on all of our VMs so that we can monitor them, right? Uh, so let's do that. Um, 
we use another Bosch feature for that, um, and that's called runtime config. The runtime config allows you to um, define add-ons, and add-ons are nothing else than jobs that, that you want to uh, co-locate on other deployments. So basically, exactly what we want, right? We want to co-locate the probe on all of these nodes, the master, the slave, and, and just the other slave. Um, so let's use the runtime config. Again, another YAML file. And we'd find that in there. We set it on our Bosch director, and then we redeploy our cluster so that the job makes its way on these VMs. So once it's on there, it will automatically, out of the box, like send reports to our scope app, and then all of a sudden we see a graph, right? Um, we Bosch like does its thing, like puts the probe on all of these nodes, and yeah, now we see the cluster, and that's pretty cool. And that's what I want to demo uh, now. So maybe like one more round of like seeing if there's any questions before I start the demo. Anyone? I think everybody's good. Uh, are laughing. They're move, happy. Move a couple of windows around here. Maybe move this down here. This one too. Okay, cool. Um, and increase the font size a bit. To clear again, make this bigger. Also, cleaned up my disk before his. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so like Bosch. Um, let's make sure. This is the Bosch CLI on my box here. Um, I can run it, get like lots of help. Um, but what's more interesting, it's still not in the best place. Move it over here. I don't even know if you can see this, these windows that are moving around. Um, anyway, so this is my, um, my Bosch CLI here, and I want to show you what I'm uh, targeting at, which, which Bosch director. So if you run Bosch status, that shows us that I'm currently interacting with a Bosch director that is uh, behind this local IP. And this is because it's a Bosch director that runs on my local uh, machine here. Um, we call this Bosch Lite, and you use this, this Lite director for like development or um, yeah, like testing um, things. And it's kind of like what you might have seen in Kubernetes, like with Minikube, right? Where you have like a local cluster. Um, cool. So this is our director, and instead of like, by the way, instead of like spinning up VMs, this director actually spins up containers on my box, just so that you know we have faster feedback cycles. All right, so let's take a look what I already have deployed on this, on this director. So let's take a look at deployments. Uh, you should see two of them. Uh, there are two deployments that are currently deployed. That means like two different like systems, right? One is called CF Warden, and that's actually um, a Cloud Foundry deployment. Uh, and the other one is called CF Warden Diego, and that's the container um, runtime or the, the, the container scheduler that, that our Cloud Foundry platform uses. So CF Warden kind of like uses Diego to run the containers for the apps, right? Um, you could probably compare Diego uh, with Kubernetes, and the containers that Diego runs are actually not Docker containers, but garden containers. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more like in a couple of minutes, but there's a couple of differences there. Um, but anyway, we don't have to understand all these like details right now, um, but let's take a look at the VMs behind these deployments because that's interesting. Let's say Bosch VMs, and that should show us all the VMs across all deployments. Okay, so this is like a test deployment, so it's not that big, but well, has a couple of VMs, right? So this is like the VMs of our Cloud Foundry. You see things like an API, a console server, um, SCD, like multiple ways of like service discovery there, um, a router, and that kind of stuff, right? And then we have a couple more like VMs that come out of this other deployment, which was called Diego. Um, Okay, so what we now want to do with scope is like we kind of want to see all of these VMs and how they interact in this nice graphical way and not just this, this textual form here. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, let's take a look and, and get back to what I, what I told you before. You have to upload a release first, this, this weave scope release that I mentioned. Um, let's take a look at what releases we have on the director right now. Uh, Bosch releases, that would help. Um, we have a bunch, bunch of releases there, but I don't see anything that says scope. So let's upload the, the scope release. I'm, already in the right directory here, so all I need to do is Bosch um, upload release, and it's in this folder here, releases, um, we've scope, and let's get the latest version, I think it's this one. Uh, typing Bosch, there we go. So what this will do is we'll like upload this tarball, uh, we'll put everything in place, in the right places on the director, um, and once that's done, which just take a couple of seconds, we can deploy it. Um, yeah, it extracts the toggle, creates packages and jobs, and there we go. Now, if I run releases again, 
you should see it here. You see, like, there's no little star next to the number here. That means it's not being used by anyone yet. But that's what we are going to change now. So first thing we want to do is we want to deploy this Weave app, uh, Weave Scope app that I mentioned before. So I ha already have a manifest for that. So we're not going to look into that right now. That would be a bit boring. And I have it here uh, on the Bosch light. Uh, I think we call it Scope app. So I'm with Dash D like saying like, hey, I want this manifest and I want to deploy that. Uh, and that should tell us like what it will actually do. So in the end, this is the deployment manifest. Uh, the important piece here is like we have one job, one instance, and that thing has our scope app, right? So let's say yes to that and let it do its thing. I think it should take about 20 seconds, but this basically like spins up DVM, or in this case, a container, puts the packages on it and starts it. And once that's started, we should actually see it behind here. Uh, on, on, we can probably point our browser at it and should see the, the UI. Let's give it a couple more seconds, see if there are any questions in the meantime. Looks like people are good. People are good, and um, so is our Bosch director. All good, we have deployed it. Um, we can actually take a look at Bosch VMs again. We should now see one more VM for our scope app in a different deployment. So CF Warden is still there, Diego is still there, and here's a new one, we scope. And Way it automatically refreshed over here. So we now have an app running. It's all empty. So all of these views, all empty. Um, that's a bit boring. So let's get the probe um, distributed, co-located across all of these VMs in the Warden, uh, the CF deployment, and the Diego deployment, right? Um, how do we do that? As I mentioned, uh, we have a runtime config. And um, I maybe show you the runtime config as it is right now in this director. It should be empty, I believe. Yep. Um, and at the end, this, these are the two things that the runtime config usually configures, releases and add-ons. And what we want to do is here, we want to um, update our runtime config. Um, I think it's update runtime slash config. And then I think I have it in here, Bosch light runtime config. All right, oops, enter. Uh, successfully updated, if I run this command now, it looks a bit different. So what you see here, we reference the release we just updated, uh, we just uploaded, and that we use for this app. And out of this release, we want the scope probe now, and we want to uh, um, basically deploy it everywhere. And then there's another thing here called scope garden. Uh, we'll get into that later, but basically we have two add-ons. But now we are more interested in the scope probe in the first go. All right, the, the, the runtime config is configured, it's uploaded, um, but we have to redeploy our Cloud Foundry to actually have the probe co-located. So let's do that now. Let's say Bosch um, dash D, so I'm pointing at the manifest for Cloud Foundry. I have it here in here called CF YAML. And um, actually let's start maybe with the scope app because we could like um, visualize the scope app itself um, by putting the probe onto that VM and say deploy. So basically redeploying what we just deployed. And now as you see here in the diff, it will actually put the probe on this, onto this VM. Um, should again just take a couple seconds. Should be even faster this time. And once that's done, something should pop up here on the left side. Um, let's see. So it's really just putting the package there and then restarting everything on the already existing VM. And to Ray. So there's done. Um, and now we see the scope app over here. Um, at some point, there should be an edge, I guess, between inbound internet um, because, like, we are looking at it. Yeah, there we go. So, scope app is there. We can take a look at the vitals of this VM, you know, what inbound, outbound connections we have, processes, etc. Um, okay, so now we would do the same thing for our, our actual Cloud Foundry deployment. Again, I'm pointing at the manifest here, CF YAML this time, and I say deploy. And uh, the director should tell us exactly again what it's going to do. It's going to put this probe there. So yes to that. Um, and this will redeploy Cloud Foundry. Now, I don't want to wait for the whole deployment to finish, but maybe we can wait for the first node to come up so that we see something happening in here, um, just to prove you that something is happening. And then we can switch over to a deployment that I already did, because this probably takes like five minutes. I don't want to keep you waiting. Um, but let's wait maybe for this console uh, VM, this console um, instance to come up so that we see it in the, in the, in the app. 
Um, should hopefully not take them long. And there it actually popped up. Um, there it is. Do we, do we have any questions? Because now might be a good time. I have a question. Sure. Uh, Luke. So how can I get this on my own Cloud Foundry cluster? How can you get this on your own Cloud Foundry cluster? Um, well, ideally, somebody would write a pivotal tile for you. And I think that you might be working with somebody to do that. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so there's, there's a Cloud Foundry release out there. Let me maybe just go there. Um, so github.com. Um, so if I go to my own account, st3v, I have that at the end of the slides. And on there, I have weave scope release. I wish I had a history here. I don't on this machine. Um, so here's the release, here's the Bosch release. So if you go to this GitHub um, repo, you can download it from there. And, and there are also, some, are also some instructions on how to deploy it. So as of today, it's a little manual. It's basically like all the steps I'm showing you. Um, in the not so far future, hopefully, there is like a, a more um, user-friendly way of doing that. Uh, but once we have that, I'm going to demo it again. Awesome. <laughs> Um, cool. So um, let's just pop back into here. Like things are happening. Like things are coming up. Like we see now network connection connections between actual nodes that make um, that make up Cloud Foundry, like console or Nets. Nets is our message for us. Um, so that's cool. Um, again, we don't want to wait for this whole thing to finish. So let's go over to a deployment where I already did all of this, right? So again, this is like a relative small like test uh, environment. So it's not particularly huge, but um, looks quite nice. So this is what Cloud Foundry at its minimum looks like, I would say, right? So you have all these nodes here and the edges, if you don't know scope, are active network connections. I believe in the last, I don't know, 15 seconds, um, the scope guys might, um, might correct me there, but it's like relatively recent connections. And um, let me just like zoom in maybe here a little bit. You see like what um, direction these connections go, where, where, where the traffic is, um, if it's inbound or outbound, right? And you just go back uh, to this. Actually, there's a better way of scrolling, uh, assuming this is built in into the app. Um, cool. So let's maybe pop onto like one of these nodes just to show you a bit more. Let's, let's say we take the cloud controller. It's basically the brain of Cloud Foundry. It's an interesting one. And uh, what we see here, again, like you see these stats. Um, the vitals of this VM, CPU, memory, et cetera. You see inbound connections, outbound connections. Um, there are a few. And then you see processes running. I'm not going to expand this one because on this VM, apparently, you have um, more than 180 processes running, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing. And um, one thing I want to point out while we are at here, just move this thing again here. Um, down here, um, you will see two things if, you, if I scroll in here a little bit. Um, the scope app tells you that if you have plugins running. And in fact, I have two plugins running, uh, and these are the two things that we also developed as part of our um, hack day. So we not only created uh, a release, but we also created two plugins to extend uh, scope to actually help us to display some Cloud Foundry and Bosch specific things. And the first plugin, maybe to show you, is like this Bosch plugin. So you see here, there's a plugin called Bosch. And as the name suggests, that is related to this tool we're using to deploy our stuff. So let me just make this bigger, actually. Um, and what this Bosch plugin gives you, it's actually all of this down here. So you see, like, there's a bunch of, like, Bosch information here, like the deployment name, the deployment name, the index of the machine you're looking at, the host you're looking at. So it's a console server with index zero. Um, the Bosch networking information, packages, and templates that you have. So highly Bosch specific. So out of the box, you wouldn't get that with scope. While the stuff on top here, the inbound, outbound connections, processes, et cetera, that's something you get out of the box, which is quite helpful, right? But you can extend scope easily with plugins. So that's quite cool. Uh, one thing to show you, like instead of Bosch SSH now with scope, what you can do is this. Uh, you can just click this remote um, access button here, and now I'm on the box. Um, not sure if I... Assuming works here a little bit, maybe. Um, but yeah, I'm now on the box, and I can run things like Monet summary. So like under the cover, we use Monet to bring up these jobs. Um, so yeah, I can interact with, with the box here. It's quite nice. Um, cool. So that is the platform itself. Um, let me just zoom out here again. All right. Um, it's the platform itself. Um, 
yes. we see it here. And um, if you have any questions, um, shout. But otherwise, I want to show you something, yeah. actually the apps that are running on top of the platform. And we can do that by maybe looking at this particular VM here. There's a VM called Diego Cell. And um, these cells, these are the VMs where we run the containers that represent, represent the apps that have been pushed to Cloud Foundry. So let's click on that. And what you see on this VM is that there's actually a new section on the left side here. So if we zoom in a little bit. So now instead of just having processes outbound and inbound connection, all of this Bosch stuff I showed you before, there's also like this container section here. And apparently, there's a container running here called Dora. And that's actually the app that we pushed earlier. That's, that's the container representing this app. And you can click on this, and you, at that point, will get the vitals for this container. Um, just zoom out here again. Don't think it like, likes my zooming. Um, I would have expected to see some vitals here. Uh, this is actually maybe the container image. Maybe I'm just getting this mixed up. Yes, the container image, not the container itself. So if you click on the container itself, which is up here, then you see the vitals of this container. So things like networking and stuff. Um, and then more information about the container itself. Um, zoom in, like the IP of the container, IP of the host, and all of that. Now, why is this interesting? Um, well, because this is not a Docker container. And as I mentioned before, you know, out of the box, this always used to work with Docker containers quite well. Um, to make it work with our co containers, which, which is a different technology, Garden, um, we had to write this other plugin here, this garden plugin that I, that I mentioned earlier um, to show these containers. And you actually cannot only see the containers in this textual format on the right here, but you can also like go to this view called containers to actually see what apps are running on the platform in this case. And what you will see here is like um, a bunch of apps called App Users Scheduler, for example. Here's a Dora, here's a, some other app. Um, and you also see based on the color and their names, um, if they are actually the same app, these containers and just different instances, right? Um, we could maybe cluster them by image, then you should see that easier that, um, for example, like this Apps Manager app here has six instances, so six containers running this app, basically. Um, so that means that if I went back into my, um, into my uh, shell here, and maybe I wanted to scale Dora up, so the app that we pushed before, if I say CF scale, and let's scale it to three instances. Um, then um, you know I can do that with one command, and in a little bit we should see um, more containers of this Dora. So let's take a look at Dora, and here you see it. Now there all of a sudden there are three containers running, and you can also see that they are running on different cells. So one of them is running on cell zero. That was the one we saw before, and then there are two on cell one. You can actually look if you look by DNS name, you can see how the containers are currently distributed. So I believe I spun up the cell later, and there hasn't been any uh, rescheduling. Usually, you would expect this to be a bit more balanced. All right, so th these are the containers. Um, I don't know how much uh, you already know about scope, but there are other views. There are like, it's the table view here. Uh, just get scrolling right again. Probably get this a little scroll out here. Get this to 100%. So you have like a table view of this graphical, and then there's also a resource view when you click on the hosts at least. So these are the, the hosts in the table, uh, which is quite nice. And then this is a nice view. You see like um, you're looking at CPU right now, which um, VM uses the most CPU. And you see that's actually the Diego cell here, the, the one thing that hosts like most containers right now. Um, and what else is there? There's a process view, which is quite ridiculous. If you click on this, why is it not changing right now? Oops, did we just see? There we go. Um, so this shows you all the processes across all VMs on the platform. It's quite nice. Cool. Um, what else is there to show? Um, well, um, so this is like running on my own VM, my own app that we, that we have pushed. Um, so if we go back to the demo here, to the slides. This is like the, the view of the world right now. Um, but as you might know, there's also like Weave Cloud. So you also get like, um, if, you, if you are a user with, with, with Weave Works, then you get a hosted version of the Scope app as part of their offering, of, as part of a bigger offering. And it would be nice if you could have something like this, where we don't even run the app ourselves anymore inside our cloud, but still have the Scope 
a probe co-located on our, on our cluster, but send reports to cloud.leaf.works, right? That would be cool. And that actually already works. Um, so here's like, um, zoom in a bit more, Beef Cloud. It's my account here. Let's go away from, so you don't see the email, which now you memorized. Um, you still see that. Um, anyway, so what you see here is like, um, I'm actually having another Cloud Foundry cluster, which is running in a different environment. But for that particular one, I'm sending these probe reports directly to Weave Cloud. Um, and now I see this nice thing in Weave Cloud, which is quite nice. And you know, you get all the same features. You even get like remote access, which is quite amazing if you think about it, because if you look at the um, IP here, this is, um, uh, a private subnet where this thing lives. Um, you see like a 10, 0, 4, 17 here. Um, and this runs on GCP. And from what I understand, um, I think Weave works. Uh, Weave Cloud is like hosted on AWS. So it's very like seamless. It's very nice. Uh, so pretty cool. And um, just to show you maybe a bit more like um, of like future integration work is like in Weave Cloud, you not only have like this, this explore tab, which basically is scope, but you also have a monitor tab. And monitoring is more like Prometheus and um, metrics, right? Time series. And what you will see here is actually that I'm not just like sending my probes to um, Weave Cloud. I'm also sending these metrics that I showed you from the Firehose before. If you might remember that slide. Now I'm sending them to Weave Cloud. And I can like query them using PromQL, Prometheus query language, right here, which is quite nice. So Cloud Foundry metrics but also Bosch metrics for different jobs. So that kind of like, if you want this all in beef with cloud, you can have that with this release. All right, cool. Um, I think with that, we're pretty much at the end of the demo. Um, yeah, so if I make this like, this is like where you find the code. I already showed you, oops, don't wanna move this. But uh, this is where you would find the, the actual release. And these are the two plugins that are already part of this release. So the Bosch plugin and the Garden plugin. And if you have questions um, after this, um, you can also reach out on Twitter. Awesome. Woohoo! Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> that was Lucas and I. <laughs> um, so uh, I believe you actually um, already answered these two questions, uh, but I will uh, you know, call them out. And one is, um, you know, will you visualize the app that you deployed with CF Push? Which mm -hmm. you kind of showed that. Um, uh, can you build meta views like say all the apps for a single business unit that are scattered across the CF nodes? Which I think you also kind of covered, but maybe there's a little bit um, more you can say. So I, I think this is an interesting one. And I think, um, so right now, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there's no concept of like any concept of multi-tenancy in like scope necessarily, right? So scope, um, and it makes a lot of sense if you think about where it comes from, right? Because in, from what I understand, I'm not a Kubernetes user on a daily basis, but in, in that world, like you as a user, you spin up your own cluster and then you run your apps on that cluster, right? Uh, while in the Cloud Foundry world, you have like this like big, you know, platform that is maybe um, um, operated by, by, by a separate set of operators and then the app developers use that platform. So it's not necessarily the app developers platform. Now, once you have a world like that, it's kind of interesting what should you see in scope and what you shouldn't. Like for example, this, like this question about business units, right, different apps belonging to different spaces and orgs. Um, so I don't think we have an answer for that quite yet, um, but that's maybe something to look into in the future. How can we make this a bit more like, you know, give you like certain views that are based on your role in, in the bigger ecosystem for what you should see and what you shouldn't see? Because we definitely don't want to, uh, you know, like a, for a hosted Cloud Foundry, like for example, uh, like Pivotal has a hosted Cloud Foundry version um, where you can just push your apps. You don't want somebody that is on the internet to go in here and like, you know, have remote access to any, any VM on the, in the, inside the platform. So you want to restrict that just to operators. Sorry, a long one, uh, one answer. Oh, that's great. Uh, and we did have a question about whether um, we've scope, um, this is the only offering that's open source. So Steven mentioned it, but I'll reiterate. Um, so we've cloud is our commercial offering that includes all these capabilities for Weave Scope, and it is a paid version, and it is um, you know, hosted, and so you get all the bells and whistles. Um, but yes, you have these options. You can do the open source version with Scope, or you can use Weave Cloud. Yep. 
are there any other questions? Um, you could definitely you know, have our awkward moment of silence. You can think about your questions. And in the meantime, we'll get Luke wrapped up. Um, did you have any other questions? We we're kind of joking that you've kind of done such a great job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Luke will still come in and have things to say, but we really appreciate you did such a great demo. Well, thank you. Um... It was definitely fun working with this. Um, so if anyone like on the line is looking into using scope to actually like, you know, visualize whatever system, um, I think um, you will have fun and you will see it's actually relatively um, modular and, 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 and flexible in that sense for you to actually adapt it to whatever your needs are. So we found it really easy to work, work with it. Really appreciate it. Um, and I'm also curious, how did um, scope and weak cloud kind of come into your radar? Like was there mm. something you were looking for? I mean, this hackathon day, you know? It's... Um, I think I've seen it like probably like two years ago. Like um, I think Peter, the original author of the tool, like I think he's relatively big in the Go community and um, I follow like that community because I love Go. And that's how I learned about it. And once this hack day came around, this was like the thing I always wanted to try and see if it's possible. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so it seems like you were able to do it pretty quickly. Yeah, so we, we spent like a day to come up with the prototype, which basically was the, was the release itself and showing the platform. That was within a day. And then um, the container plugin to show the containers was kind of working at the end of the day. There were some, some bugs with it. And since then, we, the, if you look at the repo, there have been some commits since just to make it um, you fix some of these bugs and make it you know, some of the rough edges we wanted to yeah. work on those. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, we actually have a question about non-Cloud Foundry um, platform uses for this, which I guess um, maybe we'll just pass that on to Luke to cover that. So um, thank you so much. You are welcome to um, stay and listen in, or um, if you want to take off, then we really appreciate your speaking. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, awesome. Awesome. With All that, right. I'm going to swivel my little camera. <laughs> That is such a cool little thing. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. Thank you, Tamar. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Steph. Um, there was a, a couple of questions here um, uh, and also lots of praise. So I just wanted to pass that on. Um, lots of people saying that was excellent and great demo. So uh, very, very cool. Um, yeah, so the question about non-Cloud Foundry platforms like a Docker-based PaaS. Um, uh, indeed, Scope does uh, work with um, anywhere that you run Docker. You can just install the Scope probes on any host that has the Docker daemon running, um, and um, it will query the Docker API. Uh, the Scope also has integrations with things like Kubernetes, where it'll show Kubernetes-level concepts, um, and ECS, where it'll, where it'll show different tasks and, and services and so on um, in the UI. Uh, so, yeah. Um, it, it has broad support for a lot of different platforms, and uh, please let us know if, you have, if you're using a platform that isn't supported um, where, where you'd like to add support. Um, so there was another question, which was, um, what is the performance impact of scope on each instance? Um, it uh, typically uses a few percent of CPU. Um, and Scope is, there's also work ongoing um, to make Scope use eBPF, um, which is a feature of the Linux kernel that will make it possible to uh, do more of the processing in kernel space and make it more efficient uh, to improve the CPU usage even further. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's an aspect we take seriously because of course, if you're using Scope in a production environment, uh, you don't want it to use up too much of the capacity of your cluster. Um, Cool, so unless there are any other questions, um, I'm gonna share my screen and um, do a very quick demo, which um, <laughs> as we were saying, uh, Stev already uh, demoed quite a lot of, um, but the example I'm gonna use here um, is a, a sample application that we've developed called the Sock Shop, um, and it is uh, running on a Kubernetes environment as well. So this, uh, this is just to demonstrate that um, that Scope will work with Kubernetes as well, and I can, I can show you that um, in action. Um, so uh, inside Weave Cloud here, um, we, have, we have Scope running, um, and you can see all the different components of the application. Um, so you can see the user service, the catalog, the front end, and so on. 
Um, and if we go back to uh, Sock Shop, um, then and we sort of reload the page. Let's see, I'm logged in as a user. If I click log out, um, and then if I log back in, and then um, click around, then you can see that uh, Scope dynamically shows you the network connections changing um, on the application. So you can see, oh, and it's logged me in. Uh, so here we can see that the front end is talking to the user service, the catalog service, and the cart service. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's um, that's sort of a visualization of um, of, of scope on, on this application. I'm going to use scope now to debug a problem with the app. So I've actually broken this sock shop in a, in an intentional way, um, and we can pretend for a second that we don't know uh, how exactly it's broken. Um, so um, and so let's use scope to to figure out what the problem is. So I'm going to click Add to Cart and try and buy these colorful socks. Um, and then I notice the cart uh, icon at the top of the screen just disappears. So, so there's definitely something funny going on with, um, with this application. And based on the fact that um, it seems to break when I add things to the cart, um, I, I might have a hypothesis that there's a problem with the cart service. Um, so I can go into Weave Cloud. And I can see, well, the front end's busy talking to the user service, the catalog service, and the cart service. Uh, user service and the catalog service have databases attached to them, but there's nothing attached to the cart service. So maybe maybe the cart service is meant to have a database. Let we so that's a further hypothesis. Let, let's go and verify that. Um, so if we click this button here, uh, then we can attach to the output of this container dynamically. And then if we click um, add to cart a few more times, um, then we should be able to see um, error messages showing up in the logs here. And so we can verify uh, inside scope that indeed um, there's an unhappy Java process in here. Uh, it's throwing exceptions all over the place. And um, if you look at the errors, it looks like it's trying to talk to a MongoDB database. Um, so we can go back um, to this environment here where we have our Kubernetes cluster. We've got uh, some nodes here. Um, and um, I happen to know that I can run this kubectl command uh, to deploy the cart database. So I've used scope to figure out what the problem was and to uh, validate a couple of hypotheses I had. Um, and now if we go back to scope after having deployed the cart service, uh, sorry, the cart database, um, we should be able to see the cart database show up. Yep, so there it is. Um, so it's just appeared. And any second now, I bet that the cart service will open a connection to the cart database. There we go. OK, so that works. Uh, and you can see the cart service is now talking to the cart database. I can go back to the logs for that. Um, I can reload the page again. And um, in just a second, the internet's being slow here. Uh, I can click Add to Cart. And it looks like it works. So I'm now able to buy some socks, which is great, because that's what I wanted to do. Um, I can proceed to the checkout and place my order, um, go back to the home page. And um, that looks like it's much happier now. And you can now see that the application is fully connected. And so we can see all of the relationships between all the different pieces in the, in the system. Um, and uh, it's pretty cool to see the architecture with a live map. Um, just like that. And you can also see the different Kubernetes concepts here, like pods, uh, the different sort of layers of abstraction, uh, deployments, um, services, for example. Uh, if you want to know what all these things are, then uh, we run Kubernetes trainings, so feel free to sign up for one of those. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see all these, all these different um, Kubernetes concepts right here. Um, and it would be really cool to add similar things for Cloud Foundry. Um, one more thing I'll show you in the last couple of minutes, uh, and feel free to post questions, by the way. Um, but uh, just one more thing I'll show you is, um, as Steph showed uh, in, the, in the monitoring tab, um, we can, let's try and actually uh, see. So there is one other problem with the Sock Shop at the moment here. Um, and it's the fact that the home page takes quite a while to load. And if you're uh, working in e-commerce selling socks, then you'll be pretty annoyed about that because you know that latency um, is going to reduce the number of socks you sell. 
So we can use um, uh, Weave Cloud's uh, monitoring service here to figure out which of the services uh, is being slow. So we can run this request here, which is uh, PromQL for show me the average latency of all the services in the system. Um, and then if I click run as graph, uh, then you can see um, that uh, we've got data points for all the different services. And if I zoom in, um, then you can see, uh, let's, let's apply some more load to the home page. Oh. And then I'll refresh this. Oh. Um, then yeah, you can see this, the, most of these services, like the, um, most of the other services, like the, the different routes um, in the application here are taking like 0 0.003 seconds. Um, but there's, these, there's this outlier, which is whenever you do a get request to the catalog service, um, that seems to be really slow. It's taking between half a second and 1.4 seconds. So, so that's pretty annoying. Um, but the nice thing is that the monitoring tool here has shown you, uh, it's given you direct insight into uh, which of the um, uh, components of the application are being slow. And um, we can now go and figure out what the problem is. And if we take a look in here, then uh, this is the source code for um, the catalog service. Um, then we can spot the problem. Someone's put a sleep statement in here. And um, if I delete that sleep statement, which is sleeping for a random amount of time between 500 seconds and 1500, sorry, 500 milliseconds and 1500 milliseconds, and uh, then go back up and uh, tidy up my imports. Um, then I can rebuild the container and push that container um, to a Docker image, uh, to a Docker registry. Um, and then I can show you the very last feature that I want to show you in, uh, in Weave Cloud, uh, which is the deploy feature. So we can take the new version of the uh, catalog service that we're busy building here. And in the deploy section of the app, um, you can see uh, all of the different versions of things that are available. And so we can see the catalog service currently only has a slow version available. Um, and as soon as this uh, is finished building and pushes that container image, um, then we should see a fast version show up here, and then we'll be able to deploy it. Um, so that'll take a couple of minutes. Uh, while we wait for that, any questions from anyone? Anyone got any good jokes? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think the build's finished. Cool, I'll give it a 50-50 chance of this finishing before the time's up. Luke, can you <laughs> describe how we instrumented that? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, to so, get to the get, commit, the get method? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that container push is happening. Um, uh, um, the, let me just uh, show the release quickly, and then we can go back to okay. the, inst the instrumentation question. Um, so if we reload the, uh, the catalog here, um, and we can see the fast version is now available. And uh, using Weave Cloud, you can click a few buttons to release a new version. And that hooks up to the container image registry uh, to, so that Weave Cloud knows which versions of things are available. Um, so it tells, gives you a dry run, tells you what it's going to do. It's going to update slow to fast. That sounds good. So I'm going to click Release. Um, and uh, then Weave Cloud is going to help us deploy that. So the idea of Weave Cloud is that it, it helps you with all of these different aspects of your lifecycle management for, uh, uh, for your microservices. Um, cool. So we've now released the fast version. Um, and so Kubernetes will now be pulling down the latest version of that container image. Um, and now if we reload the page, uh, then we can tell that the sock shop is now much faster. Um, and if we uh, go to the... Uh, monitoring section again, uh, then with any luck, uh, we should already have those metrics show up. And if I zoom all the way in, um, then I can see two interesting things. First one is that I can see that the release happened. So the, um, the graph here is annotated with the release uh, that just happened. 
Uh, and also if I zoom all the way in, then I can see all my latencies are down to 0 0.006 seconds now. Um, so I can verify that that release has indeed solved that performance problem. Um, and in the last minus nine seconds, I will uh, answer Anita's question quickly, which is just to show you on, um, on GitHub here, we can go and look at the uh, source code again for the catalog service. And um, if you search for Prometheus in here, uh, then you can see that um, the catalog service has been instrumented with the Prometheus client library for Go uh, with this uh, histogram um, request duration seconds. Uh, so that's how that works. Thank you. Cool. Um, so with that, I will try to share back to my slide. Thank you. Thanks so much again for joining another Weave user group. Um, thanks, Steve, for joining. I'll say goodbye to you. Um, hopefully you can see this final slide. Um, if you don't know about our Slack channel, um, you can go to this link to invite yourself to it. Any questions you have, the DX team here um, are here to help you. Um, and if you haven't found out about the user group itself, um, we're on this um, meetup page, which is the best place to join. Um, if you go to meetup.com slash pro slash weave, um, there are other cities. So this is the online group and other cities where we're growing to do more in-person events. So again, thanks so much to Steve. Thanks for joining us and thanks for staying. And thanks for joining us for this um, user group meeting. And we have a few more sessions left the second and fourth Tuesdays of every month through the end of June for this season. And then we'll see you in the fall. So thanks again. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Bye.